Hello everyone. I'd like to thank you for joining us today for today's sermon from Praise Assembly of God here at 89 Congress Street. Hope you enjoy this message. Amen. I see I left my book down here on the front row. Praise be to God. Nope, you have to stay down here. I'm sorry. Praise the Lord. How many people have come for the Word of God today? Have you come for the Word? Praise the Lord. I pray that you have, and if you have your books, and if you want to open to page uh, 40, page 40, because we are going to look at a harmony of the Gospel here today. We are going to bring all four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, into action. And don't worry, we're not going to read, you know, 60 verses, so to speak, and elaborate on all of them, you know. But we are, we are going to look at all four components. Because as we've learned this week, it's more than just the resurrection that all four Gospels pertain to. The four Gospels, you have to have all four Gospels to understand, fully understand, the meaning of of Jesus Christ and the resurrection, Him being our cornerstone. And so the uh, we are going to look from our booklets today, and we are going to be in all four places. And so hopefully you do have uh, your book with you. If you do not, God's Word is meant to be uh, heard uh, here today. And we pray that God is going to just fill you up by noting, noticing that prophecy has been fulfilled which is so important for us to believe beyond a shadow of a doubt that Jesus Christ is the Messiah. Let us pray. Father God, we thank you for this day that you've given us. Thank you for this opportunity, Lord, to bring your word forth. Lord, from all four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, have a harmony of these events coming together. Lord God, on this, the first day of the week, the Lord's Day, Lord, Sunday morning when the, the ladies went to the tomb to pay their respects, the tomb was rolled away. Lord God, the tomb was empty. And Lord, fulfillment of prophecy from riding it on the colt of a donkey. Lord God, to the Passover, the Feast of Unleavened Bread. Lord God, to you dying a Roman crucifixion as you said you would. Lord God, and to the point of getting out of the grave on the third day, which is Sunday morning, we worship you and we praise you today. Lord God, may we join our Messianic brothers and sisters today as they are looking to the tomb that is empty. We praise you and we thank you, Lord. Use my mouth to be your voice here tonight, today, Lord God, and I pray that lives will be changed and souls will be saved. In Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Before we go any further, can someone get the light for me, brother? Yeah, before we go any further, I just want to thank everybody who's been out. Uh, we've had a great service, services all week as we've studied the cornerstone. As Pastor Vince mentioned, mentioned earlier during the devotion, we had a drama, we had food, uh, we had movie, we had sermons, we had discussion, we had Q&A. We've been going at this since March 20th with traditional Palm Sunday. But then this week with the cornerstone uh, spring crusade, looking at uh, every day of what Jesus Christ went through. Uh, we just thank you for coming out. We thank you for sacrificing a week with us. And we pray that everybody here that's come out has said, I'm glad I was here. I'm glad God, God moved in the house. Uh, we had a wonderful, wonderful, uh, wonderful time studying the Word of God. Wonderful time uh, worshiping and praising Him. And kind of following each day as Jesus was on His way to the cross. Last night we looked at the fact to where after Jesus had died and was put in the rich man's tomb by Joseph, you know, that we looked at the fact that the Pharisees and chief scribe wanted to put a guard around the tomb to make sure that uh, Jesus Christ's body was not stolen. But something before they did that is oftentimes forgotten, and that is the Pharisees had remembered what Jesus had told them multiple times, that on the third day, he would rise from the dead. And of course, yesterday would be the Sabbath day in Israel. And those they were even working on the Sabbath because they were sealing up the tomb. They were locking it up. They put a guard around the tomb. They didn't want anybody to get Jesus' dead body out of the tomb. However, we're going to pick up this morning where with 
uh, where Matthew leaves off in Matthew 27 after the, the guard has been set. And as I said last night, church, no matter what humankind does, we cannot stop the power of the Almighty God. No person here, if you're here and you're an atheist, you're a deist, you're an unbeliever, I just want to tell you right now, no matter what you do, you cannot stop the power and the will of God. The Pharisees, they were even religious people who thought they could, which tells me there was at least a part of them that believed Jesus was getting out of the grave. They weren't going to take any chances, at least with all the power they had, by sealing that tomb up. However, church, again, you cannot stop the power of God. In these last days, God is pouring out His Spirit and there's nothing that's going to be able to stop God's will from being carried out. Praise the Lord. Why? Because He is the Sovereign Lord. He is the Savior of the world. He is our Messiah. And there is no God greater than He. Amen? He is the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. And there's not a person alive, whether you're talking about a politician, a sports person, it does not matter. There's not a person alive or a group or a nation that can stop the power of God. Aren't you glad? Amen. We're going to break down this harmony as these prop as the as as the as the time is 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 of the essence here. We're at Sunday morning. Last night I said to you that kind of when the Pharisees sealed up the tomb, they passed the ball into God the Father's courts. His son was now dead. What was the father going to do? Was the father just going to let his son just de begin to decay in the grave, in the tomb? Or was the father going to show up and back up the words of Jesus Christ, who said multiple times that on the third day he would get up out of the grave? Here we go, church. Matthew chapter 28. From your booklet, you're going to see various uh, subtitles there as we harmonize the gospel all the way uh, through Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Again, if you do not have a booklet, please just listen uh, with your ears uh, here today and let God's word just feed you. Matthew 28, 1. Now after the Sabbath, as the first day of the week began to dawn, well, right away, church, we know it's Sunday morning, it's dark outside, and the sun is coming up, which is why you have the sunrise service, which we did on traditional Easter, traditional resurrection, back on March 27. Okay, now after the Sabbath, the first day of the week began to dawn, then we look to Mark, the, uh, the Mark 16.1, Mary, the mother of James, and Salome brought, bought spices that they might come and anoint him, Jesus, at the tomb which is very, uh, this was the precedent that was set. You did not do that on the Sabbath because you're resting. You're not taking part in that. But come Sunday morning when the sun is rising, the Jews would go and they would perform, you know, they would visit the gravesite, kind of like some people do a couple days or a day after their loved one has, has been buried. They'll visit the place in which they have been buried. They pay their respects. They're still grieving. They still do this matter of fact in Israel today. And so here the ladies come. They're bringing their burial spices that they might anoint him at the tomb, which was, you know, sealed up, locked up, a guard's been placed around it. They were not coming there expecting to see the resurrection. Notice as, as, we, as we move in, the disciples, they're certainly not there. They're not there at all. You know, there's no one there. No one had remembered that Jesus Christ would get up out of the grave except the Pharisees who put the guard around them. Even unbelievers. You know, a part of them, and that's why I believe here today, maybe you're, you know, you're zoning out, you're thinking about lunch, or you're thinking about the NBA playoffs, or the, the NHL playoffs, but you don't have to worry about that for a few days. Penguins already won their series, so we're good to go at least for a couple more days. You know, so whatever, you're zoning out, you're thinking about that, you know, and all that kind of stuff. I still believe God's Word is penetrating the depths of your heart and soul right now. Just as it was with the Pharisees. Just as it was with the chief priests. And they were really the only ones. And they weren't going to take any chances. And they put the guard around the tomb. But the ladies come. They bring their spices. And Pat's Sabbath is over. It is now Sunday morning. And they're there before the rooster crows as the sun comes up. Matthew 28, 2. And behold, there was a great earthquake. For an angel of the Lord descended from heaven and came and rolled back the stone from the door and sat on it. 
Church, here we go. The ball's in God's court. And what does He do? Just as Jesus said He would, on the third day, God shows up. Do you have the faith to believe today that in your storms of life, that God will show up in your life and keep His word? Church, this is important stuff. There, God begins to move mightily. Church, I believe beyond a shadow of a doubt that if you start to follow the Word of God and allow Him to change your heart, as we talked about in Sunday school, God's going to bless you. That's right. You're going to be so close to God, it's going to be amazing. You're going to think, what took me so long? You know, well, church, here is God showing up. He sends forth a great earthquake. He sends forth an angel of the Lord who descends, which means to come down from heaven, roll back the stone from the door, and sat on it. All night long, they had, they had had a guard around this tomb. They had sealed up the tomb, the Pharisees did. They had worked on the Sabbath, which was a violation. Here it proves their hypocrisy right here. They rebuked Jesus for healing somebody on the Sabbath. Here they are working all day on the Sabbath to seal up the tomb, and the angel comes in a matter of moments and just rolls it away. Church, you cannot stop the power of God. You cannot stop His power. And I don't know about you, but I'm glad I'm His child. I'm glad I'm on God's team and on the opponent's team. I'm glad that God does the heavy lifting. God does the miracles. And all we have to do is step out in faith. And here it is, church. God is moving. Verse number 3. His countenance, the angel's countenance, was like lightning, and his clothing is white as snow. And the guards shook for fear and became like dead men. So here you have, what kind of guards are these? Well, we learned from last night that it was actually Pilate who most likely put Rome, four Roman guards. But he gave the Pharisees and chief priests, do whatever you wish, put as many men around it as you want to. These people who became like dead men, these are the ones who worked sealing up that tomb. These are the ones who were, who were trying to fulfill the cover-up to make sure that nothing would get leaked out by the Pharisees' plan to, to have Jesus killed and to make sure that the disciples wouldn't come in and steal a dead body and then come up with some conspiracy. These guys felt like dead men. These unbelievers, these naysayers, these folks who were not faithful to Jesus Christ and His Word, they became like dead men. Church, I believe beyond a shadow of a doubt that here in America and here at Praise Assembly, we need to start telling the mountains in our life how big our God is. Amen. 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 Rather than tell the mountains about some little God somewhere. Church, we need to start... Looking to God's word and the example of God's word of what he can do. The miracle working power of our Lord. And these guys, these guards, they shook for fear and became like dead men. Mark 16, 2, very early in the morning, on the first day of the week, the woman came closer to the, the, the woman came closer to the tomb. First day of the week, Mark tells us here that they're getting closer and closer to the tomb. Matthew tells us when they get there, the stone is going to be rolled away. Wow. Have you ever woke up in the morning in fear, but as you stepped out, you saw God had your back, and God started to move greatly across on the, one of the worst difficult days of your life? Thank you. I've had that many times where conflict and fear was just overwhelming me, and I just didn't want to deal with it. But then as God began to move, as soon as I got up in the morning, I knew he had my back. I knew as he was preparing me for the day that lied ahead, and it was just one blessing after another. Amen. Amen. Well, church, that's what we're about to see on this resurrection. It's prophecy is being fulfilled, even prophecy that Jesus had just given three days earlier that he would be crucified, and, and but on the third day he would rise again, you know, as he was reminding the disciples, however, they were, they were very forgetful, I suppose, they were not remembering any of this, and it's interesting, however, the Pharisees were, but we talked about that last night, if you weren't here, check it out on Facebook, put in a request, and listen to that message of the, of the, the faith system, if you will, of the Pharisees, but as they got closer to the tomb, Luke 24, 1, bringing spices which they had prepared okay they were going through the ritual they were not there believing the tomb would be rolled away they are there preparing burial sacrifice or, or traditional sacrifice at the gravesite okay and the, the, the spice is being uh, brought forth as, as something that the Jewish people would do Matthew Mark I'm sorry Mark 16 3 they said among themselves who will roll away the stone from the tomb for us they knew, because they were there, when Joseph, and John tells us Nicodemus was there as well, 
and Joseph and Nicodemus had rolled the stone in front of it, we're, unsure, we're unclear if they already knew that it was sealed by now, because we don't know that took place in the Passover, but there's no way these ladies are going to be able to push this stone away. And so they're thinking to themselves, well, when we get there, how are we going to be able to get inside the tomb? How are we going to be able to put these burial spices next to Jesus' body, which is wrapped in a clean linen? How, what's, going to, what's going to happen? Who's going to do that for us? Mark 16, 4. But when they looked up, they saw that the stone had been rolled away, for it was very large. So they looked up and the stone has been moved. Immediately, they're, they're going to have to know someone else has been here. Someone else has been here, you know. And so uh, uh, Luke 24, 3, then they went in and did not find the body of Jesus. They come in. The stone has rolled away, and they go on in and say, okay, well, the stone's not here, so we'll have an easy job putting down our burial spices and going through the ceremonial things that Jewish folks did for a body that had recently been buried. And so they go on in, but the body's not there. The body's not there. You may be thinking, well, are they starting to remember what Jesus said yet, or are they still lost? Well, hang with, the, hang with us here, church. Hang with us. You know, it's, it's important that we, that, we, that we keep following along, keep reading here. Mark 16, 5. And entering the tomb, Luke 24, 4, they were greatly perplexed. Uh, what's going on here? They don't understand it. The stones rolled away. Now the body's gone. Now Matthew's already told us how this has happened. But put yourself in the position of these ladies. These ladies who had followed Jesus from Galilee, these ladies who had seen Jesus do some great things over three and a half years, these ladies who were also helping Joseph and Nicodemus, watching from a distance and helping, if you will, when Jesus was taken off the cross and put in the rich man's tomb in which no one had ever laid. Here they are, greatly perplexed. How do you handle perplexion? How do you handle confusion or not understanding something? How do you get flustered? Do you get panicky? You know, or do you, you know, are you relaxed and calm? Most people don't handle being perplexed that well. Here they are perplexed. Matthew 28, 5. But the angel uh, answered and said to the women, Do not be afraid. I know that you seek Jesus who was crucified. The angel saw where these ladies were not only perplexed, they were afraid. They didn't know what was transpiring. They knew that Jesus was crucified and that's who they're looking for. They're not looking for Jesus as the resurrection here. They're not looking for Jesus to, to show himself as, as the resurrection Savior. They're there with burial spices in their hands. They're there most likely in dark clothing. They're there, and remember the sun hasn't even come out yet hardly. Okay, it's just the beginning of dawn. Okay, and here they are, 5 o'clock in the morning, whatever time it is. They're perplexed, they don't understand, and clearly they're afraid. And then the angel says, do not be afraid. Church, in these last days, may the word of God comfort you. What did Jesus say in Matthew 24? Let not your hearts be troubled. You don't need to be afraid. Some people are getting all spun up about this election. Some people are getting all spun up that gas prices are shooting back up again. These different conspiracy theories are going on. You know, some people are getting uh, really upset about how are, we gonna, how are they going to feed their families and all this kinds of stuff. Some people are wondering about is ISIS going to blow us off the map. You know, all this other stuff. You know what, church? If we're worried about anything, we should be worried about souls. That should be what we should be driving us. And, and here Jesus said, let not your heart be troubled is what he said earlier. And here the angel said, do not be afraid. I know you seek Jesus who was crucified. Luke 24, 5. Then as they were afraid and bowed their faces to the earth, he, the angel, said to them, I love this quote, why do you seek the living among the dead? Right here the angel gives away. Jesus is alive. He has not been stolen by the disciples or by the, the, the Roman guard or the Jewish Pharisee or high priest or chief priests and scribes, why do you seek the living among the dead? Church as Christians, we should be excited on this mess Messianic Resurrection Day. We should be excited because we serve the risen Savior. Amen. He is alive. Right. Right. You know, as Christians, we should be the most joyful people there is. Even when we're not necessarily happy, we should be have rivers of joy that's flooding our soul. 
We should be filled with excitement. Why? Because we serve the risen Savior. Sometimes I'll be around Christians, and it's like, if I was an unbeliever, I wouldn't want to be around that for them. <laughs> Saddest look, depressed look. You know, we get to a, a time of worship or a time of praise, you know, and, and there's, there's nothing there. Church, we should be filled with great joy. Jesus is not in a tomb somewhere. You say, Pastor, the devil's got me. You know what? The devil don't have you because Jesus Christ went to set you free. When he died on the cross, he went to hell and conquered it and got up out of the grave on the third day, and therefore there should be power and victory in your heart. That's right. As believers. Well, Pastor, my team's not with him. The guy I voted for, he didn't get in office. Well, that's great. Why should that stop you from having joy in the living God? Jesus Christ. Sometimes we get so discouraged. And I'll be listening to some of the sports radio. Uh, you know, it's the only time I typically do uh, is when all three Christian channels that I listen to have commercials going on or something. And I'll flip over to see what the scores or what they're talking about. And I remember this before getting saved. And sports people just complaining, complaining, complaining about refs, complaining about the coach. You know, complaining about the manager right now, the Red Sox manager, John Farrell, he's getting thrown under the bus. They want the, the coach of the Boston Bruins to be fired. Everybody just firing away, you know, firing away. And I'm thinking, don't these folks have something better to do than to spend hours on hold and then it's their turn to call in and then they complain about, you know, the shot that, that hit the upright but the referee called it a goal and it actually didn't cross the plane. Whatever it might be, I mean, this is this is something that that is that is is there's more important things, church, more important things to get us discouraged and broken. That's right. There are more important things like a soul not knowing Jesus Christ, That's right. That's right. wondering where someone Jesus said we're to lay up our treasures on heavenly things. There are more important things in this world than not to uh, to be called up in a game, a deal. A car that you bought. Here, he asked them again, why do you seek the living among the dead? Matthew 28, 6. He is not here. He is risen. And he is, he, as he said, come see the place where the Lord lay. This to me is pretty special stuff, church, because the angel declares in Matthew 28, 6, that Jesus isn't here inside this tomb. He is risen as he said. And hey, come on in and take a look if you don't believe me. <laughs> now God, what he is doing is he is not the author of confusion. Remember, God is a step ahead of everything that the devil tries to do. Or those working for him try to do. Here takes away, beyond a shadow of a doubt, Jesus is risen from the dead and did exactly what he said he was going to do. Now why do you think? If Jesus said he's coming back again, why do some believers not believe that? There's a faith issue. There's a word of God issue. Well, here Jesus, he proved as he said he would do, he got up out of the grave. When something gets back into God's court, and right now, what's back into God's court? The second coming. What's back into God's court? The rapture of the church. And the Father is there, and, it's, and as Jesus said, only the Father knows. Only the Father knows when that time is, but we can certainly see the signs of the time, and we can understand that there's fewer and fewer pieces of sand in the hourglass. But church, here, the angel said, as Jesus said, he's not here, he's risen, come see the place where the Lord lay. Luke 24, 6, he is not here, but risen. Remember how he spoke to you when he was still here in Galilee? Interesting how the angel says, hey ladies, remember how Jesus spoke to you? Remember the word of God? Remember the things in which he said? It, it did not come natural to them. They needed someone to tell them. Well, church, here, you know, you say, Pastor, that's, that's kind of how I am. Well, my prayer is that God's going to do super, something supernatural to let you know that Jesus Christ is alive. Why? Because the Father's will is that none should perish. You say, Pastor, I just don't think I can believe you. The Bible's written by man, blah, blah, blah. Well, that's very interesting to say that when you look at all the things that man supposedly said. And for it to happen as God said it would happen would be a statistical impossibility. But with God. Falls in God's court, miracles start happening. That's right. If you're a naysayer here, my prayer is that God's going to show His Son, Jesus Christ, to you even today, that you will receive Christ before it's too late. Everybody in here is of the age of accountability. 
Everybody in here can understand the gospel. And that take care of the sin problem, to take care of the brokenness or the broken relationship between humankind and God. God sent his son Jesus Christ to restore you and to save you. Amen. Remember how he spoke to you when he was in Galilee saying the son of man must be delivered into the hands of sinful men and be crucified and the third day rise again. Church, the thing is here, these ladies, they have the benefit of the doubt because Jesus had just, you know, been resurrected. But the thing is, church, you have to know and understand that once the rapture takes place, you're, if, you're, if you heard the gospel, your heart's going to become very hard, according to the Apostle Peter. You're not going to have the option, okay, now I believe Jesus, I, I put my faith in you. You're going to be so frustrated, your heart's going to become hard like that of Pharaoh in the book of Exodus. You're going to be so upset with God, you're not just going to say, okay, now I believe, I put my faith in Jesus. That's not going to happen. Most likely, you're going to put your faith in the Antichrist. Mm -hmm. That's right. That's right. We're going to be studying that on Wednesday nights. Come to the Revelation class. I would encourage you adults to do that. And here, it's important to note exactly what Jesus said. And here, the ladies, in verse number 8, it declares, and they remembered his words. Mm -hmm. You ever wonder why they didn't remember it during the whole process of, of after he died on the cross? Because church, when we get when we get either filled with grief or caught up in our own opinions, caught up in our own woes, it's real easy to forget. Or perhaps there's a faith issue and you're really a lazy servant, and therefore it's going to be real easy to be working and watching and waiting as Jesus taught and being faithful. So when the Master comes, you're thinking, uh, "You're here early." I knew, you, I knew you said you'd come, but I didn't expect it today. Church, you need to be expecting Jesus Christ to come today. That's right. That should be how you should be living. That's right. We'll look it up. Your redemption draw up not. But here the ladies remembered what he had said. They remembered Jesus' words. Matthew 28, 7. And go quickly and tell his disciples. The angel declares to the ladies, now go tell his disciples. Why would they have to do that? Because the disciples were not there. The disciples were doing their own thing. Even after the, the other disciples, with the exception of Thomas, you know, even after they had saw the resurrection, Thomas needed to see the holes in his wrist. He still didn't believe. None of them showed up at that grave site expecting it to be empty, which is why God had to intervene and send forth an angel to supersede the unbelief of Jesus' own disciples and the workers of Satan. God's going to show up wonderfully and amazingly in our lives as well. But if we get Mark 16, 7, and Peter, that he is risen from the dead and indeed is going before you into Galilee, there you will see him. Behold, I have told you. Here, Matthew tells us that the angel said, go tell his disciples. Mark tells us, make sure you tell Peter. Why is this interesting? Because the last thing Peter did was he ran off after he was swearing. Then he heard the rooster crow, you know, and then he ran off. And then, you know, that was that. But Jesus even cared about the one who would deny him. And this angel, this angel wanted to make sure Peter knew Jesus was alive. Maybe you're here and you've recently denied Christ at school. Or you've recently denied him at your house. I want you to know God's ready to forgive you and ready to restore you today. God cares about your heart. God cares about you greatly. And wants to have a relationship with you, just as he wanted to have a relationship with Peter. And then it says there at the end of verse 7, There you will see it, behold, I have told you. Verse 8, So they went out quickly from the tomb with fear and great joy, and ran to bring his disciples' word. Here they're now excited, they're energetic, they believe in what the angel has said. The fear there, I believe, is a reverence and excitement and great joy. They want to do as the angel had declared, working on behalf of God himself. So they ran out to tell the disciples. They ran out with joy. Church, there should be great excitement in our lives to go tell the world that Jesus Christ is Lord. There should be great excitement, you know, to, to be a hustler. I remember coaching Little League, and only about half the team liked to hustle. I used to tell them, hustle on the field, hustle off the field. You know, you have a two-hour time limit, and we're just walking out there. You know, we went, umpire yells time limit, whoever's winning after two hours is the ball game. 
You know, so you hustle on, you hustle off. In Maryland, you, we have a lot of fields, but we also have a lot of teams. And so you've got a two-hour spot. You hustle on, you hustle off because you want to complete that game. And those players that would not hustle, they would be riding the pond. Hmm. I want to hustle. Parents would say, well, Pastor, you got to put my kid in. You know, or they would call me that, call me Coach Justin. You've got to put my kid in. I said, well, I only, they only have to get one in bat and one inning in the field. That's all they're going to get. We want hustle. We want to we hustle. We want to move. We want great excitement. That's, as Christians, we should be hustling. As Christians, we should be, you know, moving forth with excitement to tell the world it should not be looked at as a chore, but instead it should be looked at as a pleasure to declare we're a child of Jesus Christ. So the ladies, they went out and they told the disciples, Mark 16, 8, and they said nothing to anyone, for they were afraid. They did not, as they met other people along the way, they were looking for 11 people that they wanted to talk to. They had a goal. They had a mission. Sometimes some people will say to me, Pastor, I, I wanted to talk to you, but it looked like you had you, you were on a mission. you know. And, and a lot of times I am. And I try to get to that door and greet people and say goodbye and things, but a lot of times I'm on a, on a mission. Here these ladies were on a mission. They were looking for 11 men, and especially Peter. Mm -hmm. Luke 24, 9, they returned from... They re then they returned from the tomb and told all these things to the eleven and to all the rest. Wow. They returned from the tomb and told these things to the eleven. They did their job. They did So they went from preparing burial spices to put on a dead man's corpse to now they're running with great news. Jesus is alive! Can you think of any other person who can be and claim the life and times of Jesus Christ, that he's alive. Buddha, Allah, Muhammad, Mr. Moon, they're all six feet under. Jesus Christ is alive. You say, Pastor, what, what did Jesus do after he was resurrected? Keep coming to this series so that you can learn. We're going all the way to June, June 12th. Jesus walked on the earth for 40 more days. He showed himself to over 500 people. He had great things he had to say. He gives great, a great message before he ascends to sit at the right hand of the Father. And then 10 days after that, Pentecost. So keep coming so that you know you have a firm foundation of Jesus Christ, his life, his death, his resurrection, his ascension, and his promise to come back again. The, the, the ladies do their job. They tell the 11. Verse 10, it was Mary Magdalene, Joanna, Mary, the mother of James, and the other women with them who told these things too. So the others, people are, after that, the 11 have been told, others are now learning, are now finding. You better believe word's going to spread. Word is going to spread, church. Let me tell you this, in a small town like this, if you give your heart to Christ, word's going to spread. Because people are going to start saying, hey man, that pastor brainwashed you. I hear that all the time. Word's going to spread. If you go home on Facebook and say, hey, I gave my heart to Jesus Christ today, you know, praise the Lord. And next thing you know, all these days there, you're just going to overwhelm you. Hear these, hear these words spreading very fastly. Jesus is alive. Amen. Jesus is alive, praise the Lord. John 20, verse 2. Simon Peter and the other disciple whom Jesus loved, which is John, talking about himself, and said to them, they have taken away the, the Lord out of the tomb, and we do not know where they have made him. Now this is interesting. This is why I like John's account. Because John gives us some insight. John gives us to where even these ladies, where they say they have taken, some scholars believe referring to the Jews, other scholars believe talking about the angel, but here, here the bottom line is John gives us a scoop that when the ladies took the message to John and to Peter, and they said, we don't know where Jesus is. But notice here, John tells us that he used the words, lay him, meaning he must still be dead. <laughs> Some people, and Jesus, we see this even with Jesus' life. When Jesus performed miracles, there were still some that did not believe. Jesus, no matter what Jesus did, he could not convince them. Here these ladies, even after they had visited with the angel at the tomb that was empty, they come back to John and to Peter and said, we don't know where they laid him. Laid in the past that's referring to, he's still dead. Luke 24, 11, and their words seemed to be like idle tales, and they did not believe them. The disciples didn't believe the ladies. Have you ever been around someone, you told them something that was truthful, and they didn't believe you? Now, maybe it's the little boy that cries wolf. They, they don't believe you because you tell a lot of lies. 
And then when you go to tell the truth, people don't know. They don't know what's happened. But here, but this, here, here, Peter and John, they did not believe these ladies. John 20, verse 3, Peter therefore went out, and the other disciple, John, and were going to the tomb. So they knew, okay, we're going to head on down to the tomb. Notice they haven't remembered anything. And it's not popping into their minds. Oh, Jesus did say he was getting out of the grave. He told us over 30 times, over three and a half years. No, they just went on down there. They went down to the tomb. Verse 4, so they ran together, and the other disciple outran Peter. So John gets there first and came to the tomb first. Most believe John was a little younger than Peter. But John gets there first, and he, stooping down and looking in, saw the linen clothes lying there, yet he did not go in. He's doing one of these numbers. <laughs> Peeking around. Dead man walking, I might not be too quick to go in myself. <laughs> I've been in a lot of grave sites in my day. What's going on? All right, and so here, here they, they ran together. They get there. John gets there first. They stoop down. They look in. They saw the clothes lying there, but he didn't go in. Verse 6, then Simon Peter came following him, following John, went into the tomb, and he saw the living clothes lying there. So John waits for Peter, and they kind of go in together. Peter probably said, John, you got there first, so you go in. I'll follow you. And they go in. And they see the clothes lying there. Now this is interesting because we know exactly what Jesus was wrapped in. Because Joseph took care of Jesus. Very good care of Jesus. Okay, and so uh, uh, verse number 7, and, and the handkerchief that had been around his head, not lying with the linen clothes, but folded together in a place by itself. Jesus is a pretty neat guy. <laughs> How about it, ladies? Do your husbands fold their socks and put their clothes away properly? No. <laughs> Come on, guys. Let's get, let's get on the ball. Let's get on the ball and take care of our clothes. Praise the Lord. Jesus took care of his handkerchief, folded it, and folded it together in a place by itself. Verse number 8, And the other disciple who came to the tomb first, John, went in also, and he saw and believed. For as yet they did not know the scripture. They did not know, meaning they did not understand it. They did not believe it. That he must rise again from the dead. So here comes, Peter goes in, John goes in. You know, and it was not, it was not coming together. That, there, that the tomb was empty and that Jesus' fulfillment of prophecy that he declared over 30 times was, was, was actually happening. They did not know the scripture. Did not know again means does not believe. The question is today, do you believe the scriptures that Jesus Christ is alive? Do you believe beyond a shadow of a doubt that Jesus Christ is the Messiah, the anointed one? Have you been persuaded of this? Praise the Lord. Verse number 9. For as yet they did not know the scripture that he must rise again from the dead. Verse 10, then the disciples went away again to their own homes. They got up out of there. They did not believe, did not understand, did not know, and they went to their own house. Where are you going to leave when you hear, you go here? Leave here, you're going to go to your house. I pray that you're going to go to your house a changed person because you've met the Master, Jesus Christ. Okay, and so uh, verse number 11, but Mary stood outside by the tomb weeping. And as she wept, she stooped down and looked. In the tomb. So we, here we have Mary stooping down and she's looking in. And she saw two angels in white sitting, one at the head and the other at the feet, where the body of Jesus had lain. We have a change in word from laid to lain. Jesus, where he was laying, the angels are at, but he's not there anymore. Mary sees and hears. The words of the angels. And are about to hear the word of the angel. And so here, verse 13. Then they said to her, woman. Interesting, Jesus called her woman too. Why are you weeping? Now this weeping here is not a cry out of great joy. This is a sorrowful weeping. As we're bringing the harmony of all the gospels, we're seeing all perspectives come into light here today. 
which is why we wanted to do it this way, so we could cover every perspective possible to give you as much of a cornerstone, a foundation as we can. And the angel said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? She said to them, Because they have taken away my Lord, and I do not know where they have laid him. The angel said, From the foot and the head, where he had lain, meaning where he was for three days. Mary uses laid, where they laid him, as far as the present tense, where he still should be, but he's not there. They've taken him away. And I don't know where he is. Could you, have been, could you imagine a mystery over a dead body? That's something like you get from a movie or something. You know, where did the corpse go? What happened? What's taking place? I haven't had an experience like that with one person uh, where, the, where they were cremated. And for somehow, the siblings couldn't find the remains. What a mystery that was. Family was not happy with one another. But it was found very quickly once they stopped and retraced their thoughts. But here, church, they're, they're, Mary's upset. They've taken away my Lord, and I don't know where he is. Verse 14, now when she had said this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing there and did not know him, did not know that it was Jesus. What? When you're, when, you are, when you're in such a state of grief and unbelief, you can even see someone and not realize, is that who I think it is? I remember the, a famous person, at least in our area, was the Georgetown Avoidia coach, John Thompson. Big, tall guy. 6'8", six, 6'9", six, big man. He came into the crab house, the restaurant I worked in, and, and he had heard about the all-you-can-eat crab legs, and tell you what, that brother could eat all-you-can-eat. <laughs> I cooked a lot of them, but he came in there. And I remember, we were sitting there thinking, and uh, the owner of the restaurant, his name was Matt, and I said, uh, and we, you know, I called him son. I said, son, is that John Thompson? No, he ain't coming in there. That ain't John Thompson. And next thing you know, we heard him talking. That's John Thompson. <laughs> you know, you can't believe this guy's in our restaurant. You know, I wonder how in the course of the waitress is. Does he tip good? Well, we're going to find out. <laughs> he actually tipped very good. You know, I was like, is that him? Here's Mary. She turns around, and there is Jesus standing there, but she didn't know that it was Jesus. Parents, could you imagine not recognizing your own child? And you didn't have dementia. You didn't have Alzheimer's. You didn't recognize him? Here, is, here it is, you know, that you didn't know it was him. Verse 15, Jesus said to her, Woman, same thing the angel said, Why are you weeping? First question, Why are you crying, woman? Whom are you seeking? She's supposing Jesus to be a gardener, said to him, Sir, if, if you have carried him away, tell me where you have laid him, and I will take him away. Thanks, Jesus is a gardener. I'll take this problem off your hands, sir. And here's Jesus, you know, alive and in color. But when you don't expect something, when you don't, when it's not even dawning on you, hey, first off, it should dawn on you, there's an angel at the tomb. Yes. You know, it should dawn on you that they're hanging out inside. It should dawn on you that there's a headpiece that is wrapped and setting in the side. You know, there's the disciples, you know, they've taken off. You know, it should dawn on you something good's happening here. Church, I believe something good's happening here at Praise Assembly. Amen. And for some, they don't see it. <coughs> God's moving mountains. God's answering. God's healing. God's restoring. The testimonies that we've heard declared is awesome stuff. God is moving in jail cells even right now. God is moving in people's hearts. God is moving because he's answering our prayers. But for some people, they don't see it. If you don't want to see something, you don't, you're not going to see it. That's not the person I want around me. I want a person who believes. Here, no, here, here, here's Jesus talking here. Why are you weeping, woman? Whom are you seeking? Mary supposed him that Jesus was a gardener, said to himself, if you've taken him, carry him away. Tell me where he is. You know? Tell me where you've laid him, and I'll take care of him for you. That's, that's, that's crazy stuff. It's an interesting stuff, but that's where they were at this point, church. This part of resurrection we don't often hear about. We don't often think about. Because, this, you know, you have an hour, and you just run eight verses, and you, he's alive, the tomb's empty, and you go on. You say, kumbaya, and say, happy Easter, see you next year. You know, that's what some people do. But we want to do something different this year. We want to bring a harmony of all perspectives, as I just said. Verse number 16, Jesus said to her, Mary. 
She turned to him and said, Rabbi, which means teacher, Jesus said to her, Do not cling to me, for I have not ascended to my Father, but go to my brethren and say to them, I am ascending to my Father and your Father, and to my God and to your God. Verse 18, Mary Magdalene came and told the disciples that she had seen the Lord and that he had spoken these things to her. So we have Mary Magdalene, we have, she's now found, found the disciples and that she has spoken to God. Mark 16, 11, and when they heard that he was alive and had been seen by her, they did not believe. We already know that they didn't believe because they were already there, Peter and John at least. They did not believe. And here, you know, we have unbelief here. We have so much unbelief on this resurrection morn. We have so much doubt that's present on this resurrection morn. Matthew 28, 9. And behold, Jesus met them, saying, Rejoice. So what did Jesus do? He went to them himself. Seeing is believing. Seeing is believing. Here, Jesus went to the disciples who did not believe the word of Mary. And here Jesus went to those who had already been there, and he says to them, rejoice. Notice Jesus doesn't rebuke them for their unbelief. He says to them, rejoice. So they came and held him by the feet and worshipped him. Do you, most people don't like it when someone tells them, I told you so. Right? You don't like that, do you? No. Church, the fact that, and I don't like that phrase either. I don't like to come back and say, well, you just listen to me. I already know God's going to deal with their heart. I already know that if it's sincere, all I want to do now is exhort them and build them up. Because there's not a person here who can do anything about their past. You can't jump in a time machine. But you can certainly encourage someone. And Jesus just says to them, rejoice. And once he did, my guess is they recognized his voice and they fell to his feet and they worshipped him. Wow. That to me is awesome. That to me is amazing. Church, so oftentimes we, we want to play the Monday morning quarterback and we want to do the, all the I told you so's and all that kind of stuff. That's not what our Lord did. He just told them. He met with them and said rejoice. So they came and held him by the feet and worshipped him. Then Jesus said to them, Do not be afraid. Go and tell my brethren to go to Galilee, and there they will see me. Go and tell my followers, go and tell my family to go to Galilee, and there they will see me. Church, you know one day we're going to see Jesus face to face. Amen. I can't wait. You know, we're going to see our Lord face to face, the one who suffered and died, the one who went through a Roman crucifixion, the one who rode on the colt of a donkey, the one who bore all our sin and shame and guilt on the cross. We're going to see him. Amen. And you know what I think he's going to say to us? Rejoice. <laughs> and we're going to spend eternity doing just that. <laughs> the Lord's not going to come and say, why didn't you listen to me or why didn't you listen to my servant or blah, blah, blah. If you see Jesus, and you're a believer, and you're in heaven, and it's not the final judgment, where he's going to say, depart from me, for I never knew you, because every knee will bow, and every tongue will confess. So if you're here, and you're an unbeliever, you're going to see Jesus too, but you won't have a very long conversation with him. He will say, depart from me, for I never knew you. And that's not going to be good, because you'll spend eternity in the lake of fire with the Antichrist, false prophet, and Satan himself. But if you come, and as a believer of Jesus Christ, Jesus is going to look at you with a smile on his face and say, rejoice. And what are we going to do? We're going to worship. We're not going to be afraid. Jesus here, I do believe he cared about his own family. When he said, go and tell my brother that they will see me. And I think it would be then that they would finally realize that Jesus just wasn't the oldest son of Mary and Joseph. He was the Lord. He was the Savior. And they too would believe. Tonight, guys, I just want to encourage you before we close in prayer that we're going to look up 
and talk about the cover-up, which I referred to a little bit last night. But I would encourage you to come because as any plan that goes astray, that goes astray such as Watergate, got Nixon, August 1974. Whitewater, Lewinsky, got Clinton. He was impeached 1998. The cover-up, to try to keep something secure, the cover-up's going to go into action. But guess what? God's a step ahead of that too. God's a step ahead. And what's done in the darkness is going to be brought to the light. And church, my prayer is today, as we've looked at all perspectives, we've looked at the perspective of Jesus, the angels, the Marys, the, respect of, the perspective of the disciples, the perspective of Jesus' own brother to a degree, the perspective of the unbelief that was taking place, and Jesus simply had to show himself. My prayer is that Jesus is going to show himself through the presence of the Holy Spirit here, for we will be convinced there is a God. Amen. And his name is Jesus Christ. Yes. Right. My prayer is, is that you will start coming into this house, more so than just Sunday morning, but coming in here expecting God to bless you, expecting God to use you to be a blessing to someone else, right. Amen. expecting God to bring forth into your life brothers and sisters that care about you, and that you'll come in here expecting to see God pour out his spirit upon you. Amen. And if you do, guess what you're going to do? You're going to rejoice. Amen. You're going to begin to praise Him. You're not going to need whoever's at the piano, my wife or Mike or Elizabeth or whoever it is. You're not going to need a person to strike a chord and say, let's stand and sing. You're already going to come in ready to rejoice. Why? Because you know the presence of God is here and you are going to be ready to lift up His wonderful name. Amen. Wow. Amazing as Jesus fulfills this prophecy. It's amazing as all the a lot of the ladies that were there were named Mary. You know? Pretty interesting stuff. You know, it's interesting how when Jesus was was pouring out uh, you know uh, his spirit upon those over the next 40 days, all the thing he had in mind was love for humankind. Really, that's all he had in mind the week of Resurrection Week. To love one another. You will prove you are a disciple of mine if you love one another. Love, the centerpiece. What did Paul write in 1 Corinthians? Without love, I have nothing. I can talk with a thousand tongues. I can give a thousand prophecies. But without love, I have nothing. I can feed the hungry and clothe the destitute. But without love, I have nothing. Love never fails. And love did not fail Jesus Christ. Even when they still had a spirit of unbelief, even after they had talked to the, the angels, even after they had saw that the stone had been rolled away, notice that along this whole time there was no confrontation, you know, what, uh, from the Jews and the guards because they felt like they were dead people. There was nobody there that could come and say, hey, you stole it, you stole the body, blah, blah, blah. There was no one around because anybody that wasn't a follower of Jesus or a disciple of Jesus, they were laying there like they were dead. There was no naysayers. Clearly, King Jesus was holding court. God the Father's will was taking place, and there was glory coming from heaven as it was descending down from the throne room of God. <clears throat> However, their heart still did not believe. Church, as God moves and God's presence was here, God does great things, lives have to change, souls are saved, some still will not believe. However, that doesn't mean it's not true. That doesn't mean God's hand's not moving. We're here, even if it just means one person gets saved the rest of this year. We're here to glorify God. Amen. Would it be great to fill every seat, 250 seats? Absolutely it would. But you know what? We can't get caught up in that. We've got to get caught up in what God's doing right here. That's right. Amen. And let God pour out His Spirit upon our lives. Father, thank you for your word. Hello, thanks for watching today's message. Appreciate you taking the time to listen to each word of God as shared here today. I'd also like to take this time to invite you to our weekly services. Sunday school for all ages at 9 a.m. Worship at 10 a.m. and 6 p.m. with Children's Church at 10 a.m. Also, we have a special men's and women's group at 5 p.m. on Sundays. 
During the week, we have several services as well. We have an extra innings class with me, Pastor Justin, on Tuesdays at 10. Uh, also, uh, Tuesday nights at 7 p.m., we have a special class on Israel and the Book of Acts. Wednesday, we have a love and respect class for married couples at 10 a.m. Also, on Wednesday night, we have our family night for all ages at 6.30 p.m. And lastly, we have our food pantry on Thursdays with servings at both 10 and 11 a.m. May God richly bless you today. Thanks again for watching.